How often do you reset your bench? Just saying, right? <laughs> it makes a big difference, even if you're in the middle of a project. It takes all but 10 minutes. I use cheap brown craft paper with some, you know, cheap masking tape and just roll the sheet out, tape it down around the edges, rip it off at the end. And I've got a clean surface reset up and it just will give you a whole new inspiration and refreshment to approach your model, especially one you've been struggling with or you're trying to get through or you want to start a new project. Aha! Refreshed and ready to go. Okay, so I gotta have one of these, <laughs> right? Nice and clean too, this one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, uh, because the bathroom door or washroom bathroom is gonna be open and you can see right in. So I wanna do the toilet and then I've already built up the sink. And I'll show you how I do it. Like to build up a like a little sculpture of plastic is I just slice the model like in like a loaf of bread, like just just build it in a couple of layers and you can just laminate it together. So I'm going to do the main bowl. Like you see here, I'll show you this photo. <laughs> see, so this, this part here is this top part. Okay. Or no, sorry. Uh, it's this bottom part. And then I'm going to put this, this on top. So it'll be another layer. So it'll be this layer. So it'll cover this, these two layers here. And then this is just a piece of scrap plastic and that could be a dowel or anything and then a flat piece of scrap. Pretty simple really, right? And then uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just to cut that out is uh, just use the drill bit method. Remember how I showed you how you cut doors out? Well, that's the same way I do s small parts like this is I just drill a series of holes on the outside of it, okay? Because this is 60 thou, and then that way you can just nibble it through with a knife and just clean it up with a nail file. Oops, sorry. You can just nibble it up with a knife and, and just trim it. Or you can just trim it with a number 18 blade, right? Chisel, like guillotine it. And then just laminate the pieces together because evergreen plastic laminates so well. Okay, and then actually, once you build a few things like this, like don't be intimidated by it, right? Just just try stuff. I mess up models all the time. I'll just have you know right now. Let me just zoom this out. Um, I mess up models all the time, right? Like hundreds of mess. I try stuff and just throw it to the side. This is all scrap, and and then I just try it again or whatever, and you know. So nobody knocks off a perfect model on the first go. It just doesn't happen that way. Okay, so that should be interesting there. Then here I'll just show you the sink. See, the sink is similar. See, the sink was just on a piece of scrap. This is 20 thou, I think. And then I used 20 thou rod. I just cut a hole. And then I just used a file, like a round file. I just filed it oval. And then I just started a piece of 20 thou, just, to, just the end of it. But I wrap the 20 thou around just the file first a couple of times just to get a bend in it. Then just tag it and then just work it around with a bit of thin glue and nip it off. And there you go. You got the top rim of the sink. And notice how I build parts on a sprue, right? For those of you that aren't aware, like 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 a model kit, but you're scratching like just have a piece of scrap, right? So you can shape the part. And then I'm going to add this piece. I laminated uh, 60 thou and 20 thou, I think, here. Or 40 thou, anyway. 60 thou thick or whatever. And I'm just going to glue this on the bottom. And I can dremel that out or just paint it black. 
I'll just round it off on the bottom so it's the bowl of the sink. And then when, I, when I'm ready, I'll just cut the, uh, I'll just mark the counter like this, right? Okay, like that. And just cut the, the, uh, the counter right off this, this sprue holder piece, and then it's done. And just glue it onto the wall, all right? Okay. Okay, so you can see I'm just building it up with different thicknesses of plastic, 40 thou, 60 thou, and there's some 80 thou strip. It's all just scrap, right? And there's the bowl. It appears to be plugged. <laughs> um, and then, ah, it's just, th this is fun. This is fun doing this. Um, you can see I'm going to build up. That'll be the bowl. And then I'll put the plate here. I'll use some 10 thou or something for this. And then uh, this gets laminated onto there. And then I'll do the seat and then the back tank. But you can see how it's just built up so far with three pieces. And notice how I build it on a sprue, right? And you just drill out your profile with a little drill bit and then nip it away and it comes off nice. So you can shape your parts. Okay, you can see how the toilet's <laughs> taking shape, right? And what I did was I just filed it up. Actually, you know, I do most, believe it or not, filing with this. Even with this. You know, you just get used to you know, I mean, that's really the very basic tools that you have. You don't need fancy tools to do this kind of thing. A number 11 blade and a sanding stick. Okay, so I just used some 10 by 40 thou trim just to put around it. And once it's glued, I just sanded it. It looks like one piece, right? So I'll just do the tank and then the seat and then a little flat piece. I'll probably use uh, some 15 thou or, or whatever just to... Uh, finish off the bottom base, okay? Okay, so good models are not accidents, right? <laughs> uh, what I mean by that is, is you can make accidents all the time on models and work them into the, the, the model as the prototype you choose to model. Like, uh, for example, here's an accident that I had. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, I used a little bit too much solvent. And I got a little bit of a wrinkle because this is very thin, this inner liner for the wall for the inside of the diner. It sort of rippled a bit. And that's okay, because these walls probably would have been plaster or whatever. And uh, I, I'm going to put a sort of a dirty yellow gold wash on here anyway, and I'm okay with that. By the time there's trim on this door, you know, and, and uh, 
shadows and lights, like I'm okay with it. So I don't sweat that. But what I mean by not accidents is is thinking things through, right? Uh, like in terms of finish. Like here's a good example. So I'm using this Wills product, which I love, by the way. Uh, my friends over there in the UK are familiar with this stuff. And uh, they have an excellent source of scratch building materials over there uh, that I've always loved. And when I was into double O back in the day, I collected lots of this. They have excellent rough cut stone slabs, uh, plaster slabs, different size brick. They're just fantastic. They come with these uh, sizes that are, I'll just tell you quick if you want. Um, they're usually five inches long by about three inches wide. And uh, I really love them. And I have lots of it kicking around and I use it whenever I need it like this. But what I want to talk to you about uh, is... Uh, like seams, like when you join something together, okay, like a, in this case, a piece of brick or a, a slab of brick. Now, normally you could just uh, join it up like this rough and, you know, you have that seam there, right? But that's not really acceptable for me. But, you know, that can be okay, though, if you're modeling uh, where there's going to be like a uh, square or round downspout or conduit or building uh, like a granite strip or a wood strip or maybe even an air conditioner or whatever like you can hide those kind of things right okay but i just want to show you a quick little tip that i do to make up like a cleaner seam like that let's say one that'll hide better uh, even though if you paint that and mortar that it'll show a bit but that's not uh totally um out of reality though i mean you get sections of brick that have been added in or whatever later in life like that but uh seams can be very difficult to hide like that and one way that i like to at least minimize it is to make sure that the end is square okay i put it on this jig here and then when i sand you know i can sand it first so it's square and then what i like to do is i just like to put a little bit of a bevel on it like a knife edge, like a, a chisel almost. So the top side is a sharp edge. And that way when you slide it on up against the other one that's similar like that, you should, before you glue this one on, is uh, you'll get a fairly good seam, okay? That'll help disappear for you more, even though it's it's not an easy thing to, to, to cover up, but I'm okay with that, okay? And I tend to do that with any material with the seam as I add a little bit of a of a bevel on the top. Just so that when they pinch together, it looks like this, right? Here's the butt joint. And then here's the other one. So there's nothing in, in this void blocking these from pinching tight together. Okay? Or if you want to uh, hide a seam, another good way is to do the same way like this and then and then bevel the other one like that and then have it so it's a little bit wider here and narrower here so when you close up you get a nice tight seam okay and that's all in opposition to this kind of thing where if you're trying to join up two butt joints together there's always going to be a big ugly gap there because this is not square and even if it is perfectly vertical you're still going to get a gap so it helps to put a bit, a bit of a bevel all right that way you get this okay Okay, so I just want to talk to you about cleaning up windows here. Uh, as you can see, what I've done is I've skinned the inside of this because there's two layers. There's the plastic sheet laminated onto the edge there, and then there's the brick. So I find that um, like number 104, 10 thou by 80 thou or uh, 15 thou by 80 thou will work. I like to use the 10 because it's nice and thin and looks more scale to HO. Now this is the fiddly part. Um, I just hold a, a, a strip and then what I do is 
because I just make a mark, you know, with a pencil and I just eyeball and I just snip a bunch. This is a little bit fiddly, but when you do a few, you get the hang of it. Now, as far as framing the inside, um, I cheat out like with longer lengths like I've talked about before. Like you can see, okay, so this this top piece here is all one piece. Okay. And then all I did was I tacked on these pieces a little bit long here. See? They're just loose here. Just tacked them up against here. And then all I'm going to do here is, because these are both two separate windows, is I'll just cut that like that see and just bleed in a little bit of cement or solvent in this case push down and then now these bottom ones that are overhung a bit. Uh, it just makes it a little bit easier to, to get them flush, I find, rather than trying to cut the part to the exact length. And now I can basically do the same, right? I can take a, a, a piece here, and in this case it's 8203 HO scale 2x3s. That I use for my window framing. I like the two by threes. It might seem a little bit beefy, but uh, they do stand out a bit more, I find. And when you're modeling an HO, like in this particular case, it's okay to cheat the size a little bit, I think. No one's going to know unless you tell them, right? <laughs> so I just um, just tack that on because that way, uh, uh, if you use one piece like this, uh, it'll go on nice and straight for both windows, okay? If you get a little bit too much glue on there, just give it a wipe. It's a nice thing about the cement if you work with it quick enough. And don't agitate it too much. It should be okay. Excuse me.
Okay, so now um, just a quick refresh. So the floor is all done here, right? The diner floor is all done and taped up and protected. This back kitchen area and so forth is all done. It's just white with a wash. I'm going to leave it white. I don't want to have a too much, right? Okay. You know, I just want this the checkerboard's pretty heavy anyway as it is, and it's enough to suggest diner. This outside wall I'm not going to deal with just yet. So we painted the inside of the wainscoting a kind of pale yellow green that I did earlier, see? And then I've masked it off though. So uh, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to use this brown for the baseboard inside of here. This same color I'm going to carry over just to the baseboard. Okay. But before I um, walk away from this wainscoting at the bar or the counter, I'm going to give it just a little bit of um, red. Okay. So there's the, it's the same red brown but i mixed up this burgundy so for those of you that are into mixing color just get a cheap color wheel from opus and art supply there's a color wheel and i'll show you how to achieve these kind of colors right that's just if you want to learn to paint like this and mix colors it helps i've been there done that with the color wheel it's in my head now so i don't need it but everybody needs it at first so okay now i'm just going to come in here and i'm going to just be really very light right like I'm pushing down on the trigger here but it's like I'm just thinking paint when I pull back right like like I get the same pressure I set that at the compressor but I just think in my mind like with a bit of practice like here I'll just show you again so see nothing just a tiny bit that first comes out and the idea of being able to pull the trigger back is to flush the tip out to to lube it wet. All right, see a little bit came out there. Now I'm ready, right? So see there's so little paint that comes out, right? And that's all you want. And you just think in your mind and you'll pull back enough and look what happens. Okay? That's just practice, right? It doesn't take long, just practice. I always practice on a piece of paper before I go in into the actual feature part on the model so so i'm going to add a little bit of this burgundy now just a hint not much though and i'm not worried about like you'll notice the wash is still showing through right there's a dark pin wash there that still shows through that's that's what i want i don't want to cover that up so and then there's a few f like tide marks along the bottom here I'm not worried about that. Why? Because this particular model to me is an artistic impression of this, right? Okay. So there's the philosophy of the model here. Like, not always, but in this case, that was the idea behind this. Is I would reproduce uh, this, this much of it. Right? So if I want this look, then I'm going to use these colors. Okay, so that's the idea. You can see where I'm going with it. And then this outside will be blue, green, very sort of blue here, green. And then this sort of limey kind of oxide green in here. And then this will be a very pale yellow when I build the wall up. But that's the idea. But like this painting, right, just so one more time, just to show you. So this painting, like you only see this, this much of it, right? Like when you're looking at it to the left of this white barrier that's all you see this is all my own design and modeling because i wanted to present the whole model and it would naturally have all this in the real world okay so that's the idea behind that so i just want to add a little bit of um you know very very thin layer once again probably more underneath like i'm going to add the bar on top that's the next piece that's going to go on Bar meaning countertop. But I don't want to cover too much of the wainscoting because I like that look, right? So because there's going to be a shadow because the top of the counter is going to overlap a bit, okay? You'll get some light ref reflection off the floor, but you, know, you want to try to think about that, right? Less is better.
Okay, advanced color school. <laughs> um, not really, like, I don't want to get too complicated about it, but I just want to say that when you mix colors, when you want to achieve certain colors, um, that's really for the advanced or, or the adventurous or the risk taker or the brave, the courageous. As they say, courageous painters or brave painters become good painters, right? They learn, they mix, they learn from experience. You know, you can use a color wheel, but you got to mix. You can find colors like, like the one thing about Vallejo, if, if uh, you don't mind painting with a brush, because you can hand brush paint all of this if you want. You don't have to have an airbrush. I like it because the paint goes on thin. I can do certain effects like the pony wall stuff, you know, just like I showed you. And um, you just get a nice smoother finish and you have more control uh, in terms of fade and so on, especially with acrylics. Now, this color here is subjective, right? Like the, like the original painting, for those of you that are fortunate enough to live in Chicago, I think that's where the, this painting is in the, uh, in the uh, major art gallery in Chicago, I think. Anyway, um, you'll only know the real colors when you see the original painting. Like, no photograph will do it justice, but that's the power of these paintings. When you see them, the original, they blow you away. Because the color that the artist was mixing in a studio, like, nobody knows. Like, he didn't leave notes for the certain colors, right? That's the privilege of the artist, or the mystique. But this is kind of turquoisey green here. So that's subjective. So what I did is I mixed up three colors, right? One for the outside of the pony wall in the top header of the building, and then this sort of mid-green, which will go on first, and then turquoise and a very light white almost. So you can't just mix these colors like one-offs because they're layers. Like he would have done that too. This is oil. So he would have blended and mixed from his palette on the fly and in the zone that he was in. So the nice thing about the airbrush over the traditional brush is you can do this kind of thing with layers. You can see the shift in color, the shadow on this side and almost white here, but he would have probably used some really good quality oil paint, um, you know, back then. I don't know what brand it was, but I can tell by looking at it that it was not cheap paint, as we like to say works, but it doesn't, right? Because the painting looks just like it did when he painted it, you know, 50, 60 years ago. It hasn't lost any of its vibrance because of good quality pigment. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to airbrush the top of this a light green and then come at it just tweak it with a bit of turquoise just on the inside of the here like I want to suggest light on the inside like the window's going to sit in this slot here so I want the light even though I'll have lights in it like I want to force that color or that light I want to create a bit of artificial light on the inside and then have it a little bit darker on the outside okay I'll just say at the outset here, I don't like the, the weight of this paint. Even though I've thinned it, it's, it still feels too heavy to me, but I'm just gonna push ahead. This is that turquoisey green that he mixed. I don't know if it's exact, but it's a really difficult color to mix. But I think I got close, and that's all that matters, really.
Okay, so just a quick update. So what I did was, is I after I did that earlier procedures, is I took this highlight color and I dusted over the outside a bit and the inside all at once. And you can see there's a, a subtle shift there and uh, it looks more like uh, the original painting. I think the color is, is about, that's about as good as it gets. And then I'll use the same color for this pole here. And then of course the outside, I've already mixed the color of blue, green, a dark blue, green for the outside. That'll make all this inside pop more with these lighter colors and the yellow and then it's lit up.